right. I believe we're live. If anyone's in there watching, let me know if you can hear me. Make sure it's good. Uh, today we're going to talk about the Zeiss 21 to 100 lightweight Zoom 3 LWZ3. Um, a bit of history first. We'll go over where this lens started, where it came from, who it's for. Uh, this is the LWZ3, implying there was a 2 and a 1, kind of the way Zeiss does their naming. There was, in fact, an LWZ2. It was a 15.5 to 45, I believe. Um, and before that, it was the same thing. They just made some minor revisions. Uh, so went one, two, now this is the third. The LWZ2 was discontinued mm, maybe two or three years ago, somewhere around there. Um, it was a nice lens, but it had a lot of competition. The, the Canon 15 to 47, the Airy 15 to 45, actually, yeah, exact same focal length. Um, and it just didn't quite hit the right market. But this lens, LWZ3, is ideal for a lot of people. Um, the price is right, the specs are really good. Um, so we're going to go over a lot of that today. And this has been something that a lot of people had questions about. Um, it's been around the trade show circuit a little bit. A lot of people have had their hands on pre-production models. Um, Zeiss did a really good job with getting the lens out there for um, shooting promotional videos and stuff. Some really cool content is out there. In fact, we'll link to some of that, uh, some videos shot by Bill Bennett, some stuff in Germany, all over the place. Really cool content. So good for Zeiss um, for actually getting the lens into the hands of cinematographers ahead of time instead of just hoarding it and then saying, okay, here's your product. Um, first things first, we'll get some specs out of the way. 21 to 100 millimeter. It's a super 35 sensor uh, or format. I in terms of coverage, um, that's pretty much every camera out there with a couple exceptions. We'll go into that a little bit later. The speed is a T2.9 to 3.9 for the maximum aperture. It's a little bit different than most zoom lenses in that it loses the light over the course of the entire zoom range. So instead of getting to the telephoto end, let's say on most other zoom lenses, you'd be at 21 millimeters and you'd be at T2.9. And then somewhere around 80 or 90, it drops to 3.9. This lens does not do that. This lens begins to drop as soon as you leave the wide end and gradually loses that stop throughout the whole range. So. It's definitely different. Um, you can decide if that's something that suits your needs or not. From our experience, it's almost unnoticeable because it's so subtle and so gradual through the whole range instead of a, a huge plummet right at the end of the zoom. So I'm not sure how the market's going to accept that, but in my opinion, I think I prefer that over a huge plummet right at the end of the zoom. For VFX guys, maybe that's going to be challenging. I'm not sure if you need a constant aperture. That's another thing to note, that it's not just um, wide open that it loses a stop. Let's say you set your T-stop at 5.6 and you're at 21 millimeters. If you then zoom all the way to 100, you're going to be then around a T8. So that, that one stop loss is anywhere in the zoom at the telephoto end. Um, other specs, perfectly standardized zoom focus and iris, 32 pitch, no funny business, no weird, uh, untraditional aspects of that. 114 front, so it matches perfect with compact primes, uh, master primes, um, compact zooms. I'm sorry, some of the compact zooms are 95. Um, nice and simple there. Um, very nice rotation and markings on the focus, tons of travel. I'm not sure the actual number, I'm going to say that's right around 300 degrees, if not a little bit more. It is 300. Our Zeiss expert is giving me the thumbs up. So Snehal is behind the camera. You guys probably have seen Snehal. Snehal, say hi. Yeah, that's fine. Come on and say hi. Just give a quick hello. There you go. Hi, everybody. You probably recognize him. He does a lot of the, uh, the marketing stuff. He gets around. This guy knows what he's talking about. So 300 degrees rotation on the focus, excellent. The zoom is not a huge rotation, but nobody really complains about that. It's not a big deal. You have every marking in there. You have plenty of marks for your zoom. Um, 
it's nice and lightweight. I think it was 4.4 pounds. Let me confirm that. Yeah, so 4.4 pounds. I don't know if that's with the Canon or PL mount, but you're only gonna have a difference of a couple grams at that point. This particular configuration is an EF mount. It is like all the other Zeiss products <clears throat> wherein you can really easily change the mount. PL, Canon, Nikon, Micro Four Thirds, Sony. Sony, uh, probably Panavision if you ask us, we could easily do that. Pretty much any mount you could want, you can put on this lens. Um, do we have any questions so far? Not in the, the live? Okay. Um, we do have a couple questions from the blog earlier, so we'll get to those in a minute. Um, other specs that are important, price, everybody asks about the price. It is set at $9,990, which is a clever way of saying 10 grand. It is about $10,000, um, no matter which mount you get it in. Uh, let's see what else. Minimum focus. The last mark we have on here, what is this? This is a metric scale. Oh, no. So the last metric mark we have is 0.8 meters. I believe the footage would be two feet, eight inches, about. So from your film plane, you're looking at right about there, which at 100 millimeters, that's, that's about as much as you want. Um, and wide, even more so, because once you go wide, that close, you're gonna start, your camera's gonna be casting shadows on your subject. Um, so that's plenty of close focus. Someone's asking if it's Super 35. Is it Super 35? It is Super 35. It covers Super 35 cameras. The exception there, once again, thanks to Red, who doesn't really conform to standards, industry standards, um, there's Super 35 Helium, the 8K Helium. They call it Super 35. It is bigger than Super 35. So uh, it will cover 8K, what was it? Uh, 185, I think, correct? Mm -hmm. But and beyond that, it will not cover fully, or at least not at the wide end. You might get some more, the longer the focal length you go, the more coverage you're gonna get. But for the whole zoom range, Super 35, traditional Super 35, you're good. So um, every Sony camera, Aerie, all that stuff, traditional Super 35, you're good. So I'd say 90% of the cameras out on the market. Um, what were some of the other questions from the blog? Uh, will the lens cover 8K helium? So we just went over that. So next one. Will it match with other Zeiss lenses? Matching, it will. Um, I haven't played with it to get actual footage, um, but from what I've seen, what I've been told, you should not have any problems matching CZ2s, Compact Primes, Ultra Primes. I don't know that I would pair it with Master Primes. I'm sure the color is pretty close, but in terms of overall performance, Master Primes are just a different class. They're much cleaner, much uh, more accurate. This lens is gonna be one notch below that, obviously. If you wanted that kind of quality, you're looking at a lens five times the price. Excuse me. So, um, it will match pretty much every other Zeiss lens in its category. It still has the traditional Zeiss T-Star coating. Um, I don't know, I don't see an engraving uh, is it made in Germany? Made in Japan. Made in Japan. Is that right there? Yeah, made in Japan. All right. I felt it on the bottom there. Um, so yeah, matching, you're good. Any other questions on the... Matches Otis and Milvis as well. Uh, Snail's telling me it matches Otis and Milvis. Otis is going to be a little bit cleaner. It's going to match color-wise, but in terms of overall quality, um, Otis is almost in the Master Prime ballpark. Uh, in fact, it is. It's just not a full-fledged cinema lens. So you could definitely match it up with classic ZF2, ZEs, Milvis, ZF2, ZE, um, probably Loxia, Battis, that sort of stuff. Pretty much all the Zeiss T-Star products. Uh, you answered this in the beginning, I believe, but is the lens a constant T2.9? So that's a question we get all the time. I'll go over it again real quick. Um, it is not a constant T2.9. It loses one stop um, of light anywhere you are in the zoom range, or in the T-stop range, from wide to tele. Um, breathing is another one we get asked a lot. Uh, 
with this recent crop of lenses that came out around IBC and Cinec and all of that, Photokina, all of a sudden everybody's concerned about breathing. I'm not sure why it became this huge topic all of a sudden. We've, we've been talking about it for decades, but all of a sudden it's really popular. The lens controls breathing really well. It's not perfect, um, but it's definitely a cinema lens. It's not going to breathe like... Um, I can't even think of a, a similar photo, or a Canon 24 to 105, similar focal length, uh, you know, chop a couple millimeters off each end there. Um, this will breathe minimal compared to something like that. So it's very well corrected. Any other questions so far? We're good there. How long is the lens? How long is the lens? It is exactly this long. Um, no, it looks... I mean, it's about 12 inches. I don't. Do you have an exact spec? It's like nine and a half. It's going to change a little bit depending on which mount you use. Obviously, if you use the Sony mount, you're adding almost an inch, or actually a little more, um, to the overall length. But it's very manageable for for shoulder work, uh, shoulder handheld gimbal stuff. Maybe not gimbal. It may be a little front heavy for gimbal, depending on what kind of gimbal you're using. Um, but let, let's get into that topic about who this is for. This is a really versatile lens. Uh, I don't feel like it panders to one specific market. I could definitely picture people using this uh, for music video stuff, high-end documentary stuff, uh, uh, corporate videos, interview stuff, that sort of thing. There's really no niche for this lens. It is pretty versatile. So who it's for? Pretty much anyone that wants this kind of range at a really attractive price. Any other questions there? Bill Holland says, is this more or less a modern take on the classic 18 to 100 and 20 to 100 T3 primes with much more modern optics? That's a very thorough question, Phil Holland. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, I don't know. It is a very classic focal length. For anybody that has been in the motion picture business, they'll recall the Cook 20 to 100, the 18 to 100, uh, not quite the 10 times zoom range, like a 25 to 250, but those classics, the 20 to 100, 18 to 100, I think it is the new version of those. It's cheaper, it's lighter, it's going to perform much better than those classic zooms. Um, there's really, it's almost like they took that form and improved everything, um, including the speed. So, yeah, it definitely is the modern version of those. They may not have admitted that they ramped back then because nobody really asked, uh, but all of those zooms, all the classic Ingenues cooks, they all lose light at the end of the zoom range. Zeiss is just being honest and telling you so it may look on paper like it's uh, uh, one bad mark against the lens, but it's no different than those. So, yeah, it, it definitely could be considered the modern equivalent of those. And for anybody that used those or is familiar with those, those are like the backbone zoom lenses of the industry. Uh, there was tons of projects shot on those, those exact zooms with that focal range, that zoom range. So, yes, very much so. Are the Otis lenses really that good compared to high-end cine lenses? Sorry if this is off topic. It's not off topic because we have them here. Um, these were sort of our plan B. If there weren't a whole lot of questions on this, we're going to go into these. So, yeah, it is on topic. Um, and I don't have a problem sort of segueing into those a little bit. Um, the Otis lens, I've been a huge proponent of the Otis lenses for a very long time. Um, it's taken them a while to really gain some traction. Uh, people didn't really believe that they were worth the extra money. They really are. Uh, there's still only three focal lengths, the 55, sorry, 28, 55, and 85. These actually, this is super, super secret well, it was, but you guys are seeing them now. These are still pre-production, um, and we've had a lot of people asking us for these. Uh, these are our brand new. In fact, I don't think I don't think anybody's seen these outside of Duclos lenses until right now. Um, they're not even done yet. They're not even engraved. But these are our new 114 fronts for the Otis lenses. So the Otis lenses are really, really nice optics. They need a little bit of help to make them cinema friendly. So what we're doing is giving them all 114 fronts. And instead of doing our traditional threaded style, we're using the existing bayonet. I don't know if you guys can hear that. 
It's a really nice, satisfying click. It stays in there solid. Um, it's a beautiful construction, rock solid. Uh, and it gives all the Otis lenses a 114 front. This is the one it looks nicest on, just because of the size. This is the 28. And it looks, I mean, you look at it on camera there. And we just perfectly continue that Otis curvature. Very beautiful, sexy, if I may. So the Otis lenses, in terms of optics, they are that impressive. They are a huge leap over classics. They're, they're a massive leap over the classics, with some exceptions. And, I, and I'm going to go into this a little bit. In fact, I believe we're going to do a whole other episode um, talking about just that, the classic, Milvis, Otis, the differences. But the classic lenses, which is what used to just be the normal ZF2 and ZE, some of them are pretty crappy. Um, and some of them are amazing. The 15 millimeter, the 135 millimeter, those are phenomenal optics. In my opinion, they should have been Otis lenses. Uh, I think those came out before the Otis existed, so they didn't really do that. Um, but the glass in those are really good. And some of the other classic lenses are not so good. That's why the Milvis exists. They're sort of like saying, okay, here's the fix for those. Here's the updated version of those. Um, so compared to the classics, like, say the 55. The 55 Otis compared to the classic 50 millimeter, phenomenal leap in image quality, huge gap. Um, the 85, same thing, huge leap in image quality. When you go to the Milvis that has new glass, like the 5114, 8514, those are a vast improvement still over the classic, but the Otis is still a step above those, a pretty significant step. So yes, they are more expensive. The quality is absolutely a, a huge jump and in my opinion very much worth it if you're looking for the cleanest most accurate picture possible and you don't want to spend 20 grand per lens the otis right now are the king of the castle uh hopefully that answers your question is there any more in the meantime uh, everyone's uh, singing the praises about the otis <laughs> So um, that, that's taken a long time. I feel like I've been preaching the Otis lenses for so long, and for for over a year, people have been hesitant. They're like, "Oh, that's a really expensive lens," and it seems like just in the past, actually, since uh, 8K VistaVision Red came out, and people started putting them on that. Since that happened, people are finally starting to say, "Wow, these are really nice lenses. These really do perform well." Uh, and I want to like, I just want to go around to everyone and be like, "I told you so." You didn't believe me. Phil Holland is reminding us that he loved working with them and that they cover 8K Vista Vision driving. Yeah, that's a big deal. If, if anybody was curious about that, including the 15, maybe Phil can confirm here, I believe even the 15 will cover, it's, one, it's not a Otis, it's still a, a Milvis, or it will be a Milvis, actually. Uh, Snehal couldn't get those, I'm kind of disappointed. Uh, but truth be told, I took the 15 with my engineer Alex in New York uh, and we shot around with that around New York City during Photo Plus Expo. It's the same glass as the classic, so I knew what to expect, but the performance is awesome. So anyways, 15 Milvis uh, paired with the Otis, you have 15 to 135, all the cover 8K Vista Vision. So that's, that's a pretty big deal. Those are all really impressive glass. Now, uh, when you looked at the, on the, on the chart, you looked at the 21 to 100. What did you think about the chromatic aberrations and the sharpness? Sharpness, ooh, I didn't look at it this morning, so I'd have to get a refresher or at least look at my notes. But if I recall, sharpness was not a concern at all. We're looking 200 line pairs in the center. If I recall, in the Super 35 field, it dropped off to 175, which is very good. For anybody that doesn't know how line pairs per millimeter work in regards to sharpness, um, that's, a, that's a perfectly acceptable number. That's an impressive number. Um, and that's just half of the, the equation. Uh, sharpness is really sort of comprised of two things, contrast and resolution. The lens resolves really well. It also happens to have really nice contrast. Chromatic aberration, there's a tiny bit, but it's, it's a great lens, almost undetectable. Any other uh, live questions there? Anything that isn't uh, praise of the Otis? No, the, there was one confusion on the Otis that it, it's a manual focus lens and there's no autofocus. Yeah, Otis, Milvis, and Classic are all fully manual. 
the Milvus have the ability, I don't have any Milvus here, I forgot to grab one, but the Milvus have the ability to declick them at the back of the mount, similar to the Loxia lenses, which is this guy. Actually, I could show you right there. I'm actually going to walk it over there to show you. I can't see it on the camera, so help, tell me if that's okay. in view. You're good, yes. So that little, uh, it's a screw, really. Um, if you rotate that dot to face the other dot, the lens is clicked. Right now, it's declicked. It's just, you know, no click stops. I'm just trying to hear it, putting it up to the microphone. So I have some complaints about that. Zeiss kind of, they, they offered the declicking, which I praise them for that, but there's almost no lubrication in there, and you can kind of hear it. It's kind of raspy. It's not really a satisfying. You know, when we, we declick one of the Otis lenses, it's the same concept. But it's it's silent. So we're using basically the same grease you, we would use when we're servicing a master prime or an ultra prime, um, and that's just one little complaint I have with Zeiss. But at least they're offering the option. That's nice. Question about the twenty-one to one hundred: Is the close focus consistent at twenty-one and at one hundred? Let's find out. Let's do a quick on-screen test so you guys can see. You might want to repeat the question. I don't know if uh, I'm going to do it this way. Yeah, so the question was, does the close focus stay consistent through the zoom? Let's use this cap. Here's our focus subject. I'm going to go to minimum. Let's see. Right about there. That's minimum. And we're at 21. I'm going to zoom all the way in. It is not. But that was probably depth of field. Uh, that's minimum at 100 millimeters. So that's a little bit more, uh, barely more. I don't have a tape measure on me. In fact, Kelsey, can you grab a tape measure from the projection room? Um, that's probably maybe two, maybe that is what it, what do we say, two feet, eight inches? Yes. So that is minimum then. That looks like about two from the film plane. Yeah. I think what we were seeing before when we go wide is when you have a wider focal length, you're dramatically increasing your depth of field so we can move it a lot closer because your depth of field is greater. Excellent. Thank you, Kelsey. So from the film plane, there is two feet, eight inches. Let's go to 100 millimeters so that we can confirm. Yeah, close focus is two foot eight inches. Yep, that's actually generous. I'm at, what is this? That's two feet, uh, that's like two feet five inches. Not a big difference there, but yeah, so it is two feet eight inches throughout the zoom range, no matter what focal length you're at. You're gonna gain some depth of field at the wide end, so it'll actually be a little bit less than that still. Um, but I'm sure if you're at 21, you stop down, well, no, that's gonna give you even more. Let's just test that so you have a number at 21 millimeters. Even though the scale is at the same spot, we get, that's about 21.5 inches. So that's good. It's like one foot. Uh, just under two feet for 21 millimeters. Any other questions in the meantime there? Good on questions? Huh? Shipping. When is it shipping? This will begin shipping January next year. Um, it's been a pretty popular lens, so for most people that are ordering now, at this point, uh, it's going to be a little bit delayed depending on who you're getting it from. Um, you probably want to get it from Do Close Lenses since you're watching this video. So you can pre order it on our site. I think it's, I want to say it's a $1,000 deposit. So go for that. Um, but yeah, they will begin delivering in January. So I'll go over a little more of the other Zeiss stuff we have here. This one's the Loxia. Uh, there's two options for Zeiss 
on native Sony mount bodies, the Loxia and the Batis. And I'm going to do a whole episode on these and which ones are better for which situations, but I'll touch on them real quick here because they both have the Cinemod. So it has our, our focus gear. It's a seamless 360 degree focus gear. It's beautiful. It's rock solid. You cannot move it. It's just part of the lens now. It has an 80 millimeter front, which on this lens looks a little silly because it's so big, but if you're trying to standardize your whole set, it works great. Um, the baddest, we don't usually do the front because these are supposed to be lightweight. The whole purpose of these lenses is to be nimble, agile, lightweight. Um, it's really, it's featherweight because it's this nice composite material. It's not metal. And it's all electronic. This one you cannot focus without being mounted to an active Sony body. So this one's definitely a more modern technological lens. This is almost a throwback to vintage lenses. It's fully manual, all metal construction. All the Loxias are the same diameter, um, just different lengths. So these are my personal favorite for really nimble cinema. These are amazing for gimbal and drone, even drone work because they're so lightweight. And the qualities, I mean, well, we could do an entire episode on the quality of those, but they're both very nice. They're both full frame, excellent resolution. So, yeah, you guys saw those. That was probably a world first. I'm not sure I planned on showing you those, but there you go. There's the 28, 114, 28 millimeter, sorry. Yeah, 28 millimeter, 114 front. So it's got the bayonet in the back. It will have a little dot. It's hard to line it up now because they're not engraved, like I said. But you clip it on. Really satisfying click. Um, very nice. I'm really happy with the way these came out. I think some people saw, I don't remember where I was posting, it might have been on Facebook, but we spent probably six months matching this anodizing. It's just uh, a labor of love. So, yeah, those should be coming out. I'm hoping the end of this year, maybe early ne into next year, uh, but definitely by NAB next year. Any questions? We're all good. Any other specs that I wanted to talk about here? We talked about the speed. That was a big deal for a lot of people. Uh, you could put these on pretty much any camera. I mean, between the coverage being Super 35 and the uh, interchangeable mount, I mean, your camera options are limitless. Can I adjust back focus with any mount? Back focus is adjustable. Ooh, so that's that's a tricky topic for me to answer. Back focus is very adjustable. It's easy. It's got shims underneath the mount. You can tweak it. Uh, I think Zeiss goes down to 0 .0005 inch shims, which is a half of a thousandth. Um, it's very adjustable if you know what you're doing. We. We have to be very careful who we tell that to. If we tell someone, yeah, go ahead and adjust it, and they mess it up, they blame us, we get sued, it's a problem. Um, but it is very easy to adjust back focus. You pop the mount off. In this particular case, you have the stainless steel mount, then you have a sub mount that that goes onto, and underneath that, you have all the shims. So you can easily do it. Uh, adjusting back focus on a camera with this not so easy, it's sort of trial and error. If you really want to adjust back focus, you need a collimator. It's the only way to properly adjust back focus. You need to be able to measure your your offset with infinity focus. Um, that's what every single technician here uses when we're adjusting back focus. You can look at it on a camera or on a projector and see, yes, I'm a little bit off, but it's trial and error. You're just going to be pulling the mount off, putting it back on over and over until you get it right. When we use a collimator, it gives us a specific number, and we adjust to that number to within a half of a thousandth of an inch. So that's, like I said, 0. 0.0005. So if you take an inch, split it into a thousand pieces, and then take one of those pieces and split that in half, that's the increment that we're adjusting these in. So kind of remember that when you're, you're trying to adjust back focus on your own. It's a great feature that Zeiss builds into all of their, their modern cinema lenses, the CP2s, CZ2s, LWZ, um, even the higher end stuff, Ultra Primes, Master Primes, but it's something that needs to be done properly. It's kind of like asking, can I adjust the alignment on my car? Yeah, you can kick the tires, but you may not get it right. So, hope that answers your question. Sorry if I disappointed you. Uh, rental houses have collimators, right? 
Uh, hmm. Rental houses should have collimators. Snehal just asked uh, if a rental house can collimate these. A, a good rental house will absolutely have a collimator. Uh, any half-decent rental house is man, uh, maintaining their own lenses. You need a collimator. Every rental house in town that's worth going to has a collimator. And they can... I actually give a lecture on this exact topic of uh, dealing with rental houses and lenses, which I don't know... I hope I'm doing a service to the rental houses and not a disservice. Um, but... Uh, if you're really friendly with the rental house, they may let you use it but you probably should just be more friendly with the technician there who will do it for you or charge you for it or just come to do close lenses. In fact, that's something worth noting. I don't want to get too sales mini on you guys, um, but collimation is something that we do for every lens that you purchase from do close lenses, I, whether it's a Zeiss, Ingenue, Cook, Canon, whatever. Um, for two years, you get that for free. It comes with every lens. You send it in, we collimate it, we give it a complete diagnostic check the works. It's basically routine maintenance for two years, and we don't charge anybody for that. So if you're worried about back focus and infinity focus and keeping everything up to spec, uh, just buy it from us and we'll take care of it. Any other questions? I think we're good then. Um, we will do another episode specifically on the DSLR stuff being used for cinema. Um, hopefully, when are the Milvis shipping, do you know? The new Milvis? Uh, this month. This month? Okay, so then we'll definitely do it soon. I want to do that once the 15 uh, and the 135 Milvis come out, especially the 18. The 18 Milvis, so like I said before, the, eight, uh, sorry, the 15 and the 135 are just borrowing their glass from the classic which is already excellent glass. So I don't want them to update that glass. It's beautiful as it is. The 18 Classic was a pretty atrocious lens. The, the image quality was bad. The speed was really slow. I think it was a 3.5. Um, even the coverage was questionable. It didn't quite cover full frame. Um, so in the Milvis, that is a brand new design. And I have really high hopes for that lens. So once we get our hands on that, we're going to do a whole video on... Milvis, sorry, classic Milvis, Otis, and then maybe uh, Battis and Loxia. But really the, the traditional line is what we're looking at mostly. So check back for that one. Um, probably, probably December or maybe January we'll do that one. But just follow us, you'll see when we do it. Can you do a summary of all the features? In the summary of all the features. So if anyone's joining us late and you don't feel like hitting rewind um, or watching it again, uh, I'll start from the back and move forward. Interchangeable mounts, PL, Nikon, Canon, Micro Four Thirds, Sony, every, it, pretty much anything you want. Um, it's a T2.9, drops by one stop at whatever you're at, so T9 to 3.9 when you're wide open. 21 to 100, uh, covers Super 35, 300 degree focus rotation, actually really well lubricated. Again, we'll do the, the quick little sound test. I can't show you guys on our a torque meter or anything, but I don't know if you can hear it in the microphone there. There's nothing to here, really. It's silent, because it is really well lubricated. It's nice and fluid. I take a little issue with some of the CP2s, because they're pretty heavy, but this is a nice focus rotation. I don't know how close this is to production, do you know? Is this a pre-production? pretty close. Okay, so this is pre-production, but definitely close. Um, 114 front, 4.4 pounds, uh, which is very manageable. Comparatively, that's it's right in that same weight range on the lower side of the weight compared to like the Canons, uh, um, the Allures, that sort of thing. I think the Canons are 4.8 pounds, so very similar. But this is definitely hand holdable, definitely shoulder friendly. Um, what other specs? <laughs> That about sums it up. Uh, if, you, if you turn the zoom a quarter turn, you lose a quarter stop of light. Half turn, half stop of light. That makes sense. Yeah, yeah so Sneha was just saying if you turn the, the zoom a quarter of the rotation, you lose a quarter of a stop. Which makes sense, because throughout the whole range you lose one stop. 
So if you're halfway between 21 and 100, somewhere around 60-ish, you're going to lose half a stop. Makes sense. Makes total sense. Um, and that's the case anywhere in your T-stop range. So if you're set at a T8, at 21, you will have a T8. At 100, you're going to be around 11. So give us your feedback on that. Let us know if you like that. Because it is kind of new. It's not. Uh, I don't know any other zoom lens that does that. Every other lens has a maximum aperture, and then it just plummets at the very end of the zoom. So let us know if that's good, bad, and different. If you could work with it, if it's something you want us to give back to Zeiss and say, "Hey, make another lens that doesn't do this." Um, yeah, that'll be good. Sneha reminds me that you have the CZ twos, which is a really good point. It's a, a good. Uh, they're, they're different lenses for different categories. The CZ2s are faster. They're actually, sorry, no, they're a T2.9, but they maintain a T2.9. They are full frame. The trade off there is you have a tiny, tiny zoom range. I, don't, I think they're less than a two times. No, sorry. The 15 to 30 is exactly two times. So they're very short zoom ranges. This is a, basically a 5 to 1 zoom. Those are like a 2.1 zoom, a 2.1 to 1. Um, so different features, and it's all just physics. It's all limited. You have to trade off no matter what lens you're talking about. So take it for what it is. If you want something with a consistent zoom range, go to the CZ2, um, but then you're going to have a tiny zoom range. This benefits from a much longer range. So yeah, I think that about wraps it up. Uh, any other questions, drop them in the comments below. We'll keep answering those. Um, Pre-order, I don't know if there's a short link for this. Let me find out real quick. Bear with me one moment. Uh, Duclos.tv slash 21100. Nope, that doesn't work. Well, just go to our website. It's right there. If you go to Zooms, Zeiss, uh, I think it's in the top left. Um, and we'll put a link, if there's not already a link in the video, we'll put a link to, to pre-order it. But get those in quick, because this is going to be a pretty popular lens. And uh, that'll do it.